David, welcome to the show. Thanks, Meb. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Where in the world are you today? I am actually in my office in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I've been coming to the office pretty much throughout the whole Corona environment because I had three kids in college who were suddenly at home. Uh, and this was like the quietest, safest place for me to be. Well, for most, most of these uh, millennials and younger, you better get used to them being at home post-college too. That seems to be the, the residence of choice. Uh, Louisville, awesome town. Last time I was there, I was giving a talk to the local CFA Society. But the highlight for me, first time I've ever given a speech, I think, where they gave me a bottle of bourbon afterwards as a thank you for coming. So uh, thumbs up to the local CFA shout out. And got to sit outside at uh, a restaurant, eat boiled peanuts, which are like my favorite thing on the planet. Um, need to get back. Great town. Nice. Yeah, it is a great town. We at DPL give out bourbon at our booth when we, whenever we do conferences. We do tons of events around the country. We have a bourbon giveaway every, every time, and that's a huge hit. I, I can see why. Uh, before we got started, who's your baseball team? We were chatting a little before we began. You got a, you got a hometown my team? My baseball team is the Red Sox. I grew up in D.C. when there was no team and gravitated towards the Green Monster as a little kid. So uh, I'm a diehard Red Sox fan. I've been to Fenway every before this year of course every year of my life since i'm 16. i love it uh we're going to talk about something today we've done over 200 episodes and to my knowledge i don't think we've ever covered annuities and we cover some wacky stuff on this podcast we talk about farmland and quantitative investing we talked about private equity in Kazakhstan or something, you know, Uzbekistan uh, in, a, in a recent podcast. We never touched annuities. And I'm ready for you to just give us all the pros and cons, the good, the bad, the landmines, everything else. I think a lot of people, when you say annuities, they think of two things. They think of fees and they yep. think of Ken Fisher. That's so right. let's, let's go super basic. Most, <laughs> most everyone on this podcast is, is, is a pro the listeners, but let's start basic. Talk to us about what is an annuity, general concept, some examples, and we'll start to, to dig into what you guys do. Yeah, so an annuity at its core, I mean, there, there are different kinds of annuities, and that's one of the big misperceptions, you know, for you know, particularly fee-only advisors who don't often and haven't, you know, used the products in the past because it's been such a commission-driven product and industry and insurance. Um, but an annuity is basically a tax deferred wrapper that you, can in, that you can invest in with the ability to annuitize, meaning create a stream of income. That's the fundamental thing that an annuity is. There's two, real, you know, pri or three, let's call it three primary kinds of annuities. You know, one is a variable annuity. Everybody's kind of familiar. They're probably the ones with the worst wrap. Um, where you invest in funds for during the accumulation point. So you can, which is fundamentally a great thing, right? Tax deferred accumulation. You know, the historic problems come in the costs and we'll get to that. But so you're investing in funds tax deferred and then ultimately you probably want to turn it into an income stream when the client gets to retirement. That's a variable annuity. Then fixed indexed annuities or fixed annuities uh, are you know the other side, which basically you're getting an interest rate return, like a fixed return rather than a variable return, you know, through the market. So super safe. You're going to think of it and compare it to like bonds and how you know how they perform against bonds. And similarly, you might turn that into a stream of income. Um, or then you have income annuities, which is you know what a lot of people think about. You know, SPIAs, single premium immediate annuities, where you turn over your assets, your client's assets to the insurance company in exchange for a lifetime income stream. Uh, and those are kind of the three basic ca you know, categories uh, of annuities, but the fundamental use is tax deferred accumulation and income generation. Uh, also, you know, risk and through doing those things, risk management. So let's set, set the stage a little bit. Um, 
my parents' generation, my dad was a, a lifetime aerospace guy. And I remember talking to him when I was younger, but the concept was you get a great job, you work hard, you get a pension, you get yes. put your feet up, go to Hawaii, whatever it is when uh, your, your retirement is secured. That for the most part is no longer the case, particularly right. in 2020, your kids, uh, you know, defined benefit is mostly um, gone. And so many people are in charge of their own retirements outside of social security. And if you look at the statistics for 401ks and IRAs and everything else, uh, a lot of people aren't uh, focused on retirement. Tell me about the general industry trends, uh, a little bit about the, why this is a fit, why this is a need in general for annuities. So we'll look at the good aspects and then we'll get into a lot more specifics of of what to look for and what to avoid yeah well so the general trends like you're talking about so funding retirement so if you think about you know funding retirement it used to be easy right either maybe you had a pension you know like like you're talking about uh, your father you know now like you said unless you're a government employee maybe a union employee you probably don't have a pension so it's really left upon the individual to fund their retirement. So annuities, you know, oftentimes, you know, David Blanchett from Morningstar Retirement Research are often refers to them as the A word. I mean, academics love them, but people, you know, the people get afraid of the A word because there's been so much negative press relative to bad sales practices and tactics and stuff like that. But fundamentally, it's a really good product because it's like a personal pension. You know, you're gonna fu- you're gonna fund it and then you're gonna turn it into that guaranteed income stream uh, you know, during retirement, which is you know, a really important thing, particularly today where life expectancy is you know, continuing to expand, uh, particularly for you know, the wealthier, healthier set. Um, you know, the <laughs> Society of Actuaries says that today, a 65 year old couple, there's a 50, 49% chance that one of them will be alive at 95. So you're looking at funding a 30 year retirement, you know, basically on your own, you know, minus social security. Uh, and you have to do that in a world where interest rates are really low, historically low and, and mired there for, you know, who knows how long. So the traditional investment approach to funding retirement used to be you allocate heavily to stocks and equities during accumulation when you've got more time and ability to absorb market cycles and then risk management meant moving from equities to bonds. Well, today bonds fixed income can't do the job of funding retirement that it once did. So you have all these problems kind of coming together. You've got, expanding life expectancies, you've got pensions going away, you've got interest rates really low. So how do you safely fund retirement income? Uh, and annuities you know, are a great answer to that. And historically, you know, I would have the same trouble that most people do. Annuities, you know, it's a great idea, but they're too expensive. And that gets to you know, what we do at DPL, which is basically reduce the expense because we're taking commissions out. Right. When you take yeah. commissions out of the product, you change it completely. Yeah. The um, I think the average fee that I've seen cited, and I don't know if this how this, you know, includes the commission, but I think Morningstar says it's around 2.25%. Does that sound ballpark correct? It depends what you're including, but, so, yeah. but the average Morningstar, I'll tell you the average product cost. So none of the features, not including the investments, uh, are is about you know 140 bips, so yeah. about 140 basis points when you add in the cost and the variable annuity of, of the funds, which are typically you know loaded you know with 12b1 fees, admin fees, they're expensive funds. Uh, you can get up over you know that takes you over two percent. If you add in a you know an income rider or something like that, you can be like three and a half percent you know fully loaded into a traditional commission product. When you take the commission out, you know, the commission comes out of the basic product expense. You take, you basically take the product cost down from 140 basis points to 20 to 25 basis points. So that's where, you know, the product becomes again, interesting, right? As I was talking about, like in a variable annuity, tax deferred accumulation is a good thing. 
if it's gonna cost you 140 basis points to get it, it's not such a good thing. Tax deferral is not infinitely valuable. You know, but at 20 basis points, 25 basis points, tax deferred accumulation for high income earners, that's a good product. Yeah, so just to give a little context for the listeners who, who've never been through this. Let's say you're a 30 year old, nice and young, got a hundred grand. So man, you've been saving, you, uh, you wanna put it to work in a variable annuity and just in general, um, we'll get to y'all's model in a minute. Um, and you can correct me, like the, you hit the nail on the head. There's, in my mind, there's two main massive benefits. One is this tax deferral. So uh, you put that hundred grand in at age 30, let's say you're not gonna take anything out till 60 or 70, cause we're all gonna live to hundred now. Yeah. Um, and at that point you can establish the percent you wanna take out, right? And it gets tacked at, as, as normal income on the gains and then the, the principal gets returned. Is that ballpark correct? Yeah, I mean, you, you wanna think sure. about it a little bit that way, but I would say if you've got a young, if you're looking at a young person, if you're a young person, you have a young client, you really wanna think about a bare bones annuity. Right? You, you, don't, you don't need to worry about the income riders or anything like that because you're looking at 35, 40 years until you're thinking, until you're thinking about using them. So why pay for it? Right? Yeah. So just go to a stripped down bare bones annuity, accumulate you know, for those you know, 35, 40 years, and then start thinking about when you start getting closer to needing income, looking at rolling that product into something else that might be income generating. Yeah. And so, you know, listeners, just put this in context. Remember, if you compound at 10% per year, 25 years, that 100 grand is going to be worth a million bucks. That million bucks, uh, if you can compound 50 years, that 100 grand is, is 10 million bucks. So it's non trivial. Granted, not many 20 year olds run around with 100 grand, but just the second main benefit in my mind. So you have this huge tax benefit. And the second main benefit is people tend to think about retirement, I think, behaviorally and mentally different than they do with the rest of their investments. You know, there's their brokerage account, it's fun, it's Robin Hood. And then over here is my retirement and putting it into something like an annuity, which uh, in many cases you can auto invest in or invest in every year. And it can be in a portfolio of hundred percent global stocks or whatever you want it to be in. Um, I think gives it the time to align an investor's true time horizon, which should be decades with actually, uh, how they're going to behave. Is that, are those kind of, does that seem uh, accurate to you as the main sort of benefits? Yeah. I mean, there's, there are, you know, loads of behavioral benefits, you know, for annuities, you know, depending on, you know, the, the phase of investing or, or retirement, you know, in, you know, a client might be in or a person might be in. So, you know, during accumulation, you know, it's, you know, helpful through the tax deferral and it's also you know, a retirement account. So it's not one you're likely to touch. Um, then as you're, you know, as you're getting to, you know, retirement, you know, downside protection features and annuities are great for sequence of returns risk. And then in retirement, that secure income, you know, has many behavioral benefits. One, you know, and we experienced this through the pandemic, right? It, particularly early on when the market was going nuts and mostly down, right? And it, the advisors we work with, you know, they're all telling their clients, you know, stay the course, you know, hang on, stay the course, you know, let's ride, you know, let's ride this out. Well, for those who have an annuity, it's much easier to do that, you know, behaviorally, because they know their income is secure. They're not worried so much about the market going up and down and it, it being able to affect, you know, their retirement spending. And um, so behaviorally, that's, you know, really helpful, um, you know, for clients. And so, all right, so we covered the good stuff. So I imagine a lot of investors are scratching their head and say, okay, why does everyone hate annuities? Why is Ken Fisher always ranting about them? Why are they the A word? And you've alluded to it, um, you know, a few times, but maybe walk us through the pitfalls and the problems of the conflicts of interest and the massive, massive, massive fees. Yes. So the, you know, when you look at economists and you look at you know academics who study you know retirement annuities are universally supported you know everybody loves annuities academically the problem is when you get to the product and i would tell you 
you know, I tell you, I, I will say often the root of all evil when it comes to annuities are commissions. Commissions drive all the problems that everybody complains about. Number one, high costs. As I was talking about just a little bit earlier, you know, it's when you take the commission out of the product, you're dropping the cost, you know, 80%. You know, so that's a, you know, so that's a huge driver of the cost uh, of the product is having, is having the commission. That's one big problem. Another big problem is bad behavior. You know, you always read about it in, in trade pubs. Some annuity salesman who sold an 80 year old woman a product with, you know, a 30 year surrender for a huge commission. You, know, you read about bad behavior of salesmen and that's driven again by commission. The other, you know, part of annuities that people don't like, particularly advisors, are surrender periods. So the money's locked up, you know, for a period of time. Uh, you know, usually seven years, sometimes as many as 10, 15 years. And that again is driven by commission because the insurance carrier needs to make sure they've got the funds long enough to recoup the commission that they paid out. So you have all of those problems, you know, with the product itself. And then for fiduciaries and, you know, fee-only advisors, you know, of which, you know, Ken Fisher is one, there's the other problem of because it's commission, they can't get paid. So, you know, it takes a, you know, it's a hardcore fiduciary who says, yeah, let me take a third of my client's portfolio and put it into an annuity, take it out of my AUM and, you know, and let them, you know, live off income from that. I can, I can generate income through investing. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the classic, I mean, this is the most like 101 level of incentives controlling everything. So, the reason yeah. most investors won't just go buy an annuity themselves is they're endlessly complicated. I mean, I'm a professional and I was looking through some of these uh, annuity descriptions and I literally could not make heads and tails of what was what. Um, you know, again, the basics are, of the ones are, are really simple, but others are not. Second, you have people in companies that are entirely sales driven. I mean, and this isn't just annuity world. This is, I mean, half the financial planning world, right? The history of, uh, you describe the, the way they make money as production, you know, and, and you see the, you go to Hawaii and go to the hotels and you see everyone that are the top, uh, salespeople, right. That, 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 right. uh, and you know, and, and, and in a world of the internet and doesn't transparency, much of it, you know, feels pretty yucky. And so, and then lastly, it's a, it's even not, I don't think a conflict problem, but it is a, a reality is that advisors who advise on accounts, you know, again, that to put money in annuities, they traditionally will earn nothing from that. Okay. So this is where you guys come in, I assume. Is that a good lead in to what you guys are up to at, uh, at DPL? Yeah, that's a that's a really good segue. To solve so, solve all the world's problems for us right now. Let's hear it. That's right. Well, I don't know about all the world's problems, but hopefully most of them as they relate to annuities um, and insurance generally. So you know, we at DPL, what we do, and I spent, you know, I basically spent my career in financial services, you know, being a disruptor. I in the mid '90s. I was the chief marketing officer at the first internet bank, you know, in the country. And the notion behind doing that was not the internet. It was, let's create consumer value and let's, and let's do it through changing distribution. And distribution, you know, had always been in banking, let's build branches. And building buildings and filling it with people and systems is a really expensive way of selling a checking account or a CD. So we thought, you know, if we eliminate the branch and we go direct to consumer, we can provide much better, much better value. Can I pause you real quick? Because sure. I know you you were uh, at E Trade, right? Correct. E Trade and Telebank before that. Yep. I had I had some uh, fond, embarrassing memories of being uh, at the the very distinctive E Trade branch in downtown San Francisco when the internet bubble was going on. So I was either visiting or living there in 2000, 2001. I remember going into the branch to place trades, which yeah. the, you know, Meb of 2020 is horrified about, but uh, <laughs> just funny, funny to look back on as you were talking about branches and E-Trade, um, you know, the, the world is 
similar but different now with Robin Hood and uh, everyone can do it from home at this point, but okay, continue on. That's right, but um, so anyhow, so the big inefficiency in distribution of banking is the branch. In insurance, it's the commission. You know, so much, you know, much like, you know, back in the, in the day when, when Schwab really created the marketplace, created one source to be a marketplace for no load uh, mutual funds, Basically, that's what we're doing at DPL. We're eliminate. We're working with carriers to eliminate the commissions, take out that expense and inefficiency, you know, in the product, and create a marketplace of commission-free insurance products, um, which start with you know annuities, but include life insurance, long-term care, disability, you know, all products that you know the typical financial plan or you know aspects of life typical financial plan is going to address. So that starts, you know, that kind of starts the chain of creating a value proposition for, you know, for clients uh, and advisors. We work with, you know, we launched the company two and a half years ago. Uh, we, and prior to that, I'd spent a decade building a company called Jefferson National, which was the, you know, kind of leader in providing, you know, no load annuities for, you know, for RIAs. But we launched DPL with, you know, six carriers and a dozen products, you know, back in early 2018. Uh, today, we've got 20 carriers, 45 products, you know, starting to build, you know, a real marketplace of, you know, commission-free insurance. And we work, so we work with the carrier on the products, uh, and then we work with RIA firms, you know, to support them. Uh, in a very strategic way to introduce insurance into their practice. And in the, we work on a membership basis. So we've got, you know, RA firms who join DPL as a member in the two and a half years we've been doing that. We've got over a thousand firms who've joined. Wow. That's awesome. Congrats. Um, and I imagine the RA is listening. You guys don't charge that much. So is the, is the business model a little bit of the sort of, membership fee, and then also partnership with the underlying uh, providers? Yes, exactly. So yeah, we don't, we don't charge very much. It's a little, you know, it's a unique model. So in building it, uh, there was nothing to point to, to say what's a reasonable fee, <laughs> fee to charge. Uh, most firms we work with uh, will, you know, will tell us, you know, that we could charge quite a bit more, but that's not been, that's, you know, it's not been the goal. The goal was to build the network. You know, having the network of advisors, the membership base, is really what drives our ability to, to innovate and drive product creation with the carriers. So it's one thing when I can kind of trade off my name and getting started and get a few carriers to you know, build products. But it's another thing when we can say, hey, we've got a thousand RIA firms with you know, a collective 250 billion in AUM. Uh, that we represent and we're looking for these kind of products and this kind of pricing. And so we've got a lot more, you know, a lot more power in doing that. Uh, and, and that'll just continue to grow as we can, as we continue to launch. But what we do for our members is really, we kind of become their insurance department. So, you know, a typical RIA is not insurance licensed because, you know, why would you be if, you know, the products have been commissioned all along. So we are the licensed agent. You know, we work with our carriers to edge, you know, with our uh, RIA members to educate them. We educate on products, we educate on usage, uh, and we teach them, you know, when products are, are most effective and when they're going to be most helpful to clients. And we base all of that off academic research. Um, then we help implement. So when a client comes in or a client's nearing retirement or what, you're redoing the financial plan, and you're just and you're identifying an insurance need. You talk to one of our consultants. Uh, they're gonna you know talk about the client situation, and then they're gonna give you a couple product options. They're gonna say here's you know here's this one will do this, and this one will do that, and you know you'll help determine the appropriate one for your client, and then we'll implement. We'll be the agent of record. We'll take care of all the paperwork, and then we'll make sure you get a data feed into your portfolio management system so you can see the account. And if you want to illustrate it in your financial planning software, we can help you do that as well. So I imagine you're incredibly partner, uh, popular with one cohort, which is independent RIAs, and incredibly yep. unpopular 
with the people that are still charging 8% commissions. So it's a good Venn diagram to be in, by the way. There's so sure. much fat in that space. It's astonishing. And you have, you know, one part of the world, like the, the public funds where, you know, it's the trickle has become a, a flood and, and essentially the dam breaking on all these old school high fee funds, money going into the, the lower cost mm -hmm. ETFs and such. But there's so much that still has, you know, trillions in uh, uh, that hasn't been disrupted. Talk to me a little bit about, and you can take this question in a few different ways, how the thousand or so RIAs are implementing this. Do you see any trends? Are most of them just saying, hey, I'm going to do variable annuities across my book? Or are they super specific? You reference insurance. We'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. But like, how are people using it in the last two years? Are there some surprises? What else? So, I mean, in a lot of different ways. So when I started the company, the RIA insurance market was basically term life, uh, and investment only variable annuities, what we did at Jefferson National. So, you know, just super low cost, get your clients out of an expensive product, move them into something cheap. That, that was basically the, the, the market in the RA world. So as we launched DPL, that was kind of the, you know, the first product sets people were interested in, fill those kind of products, you know, for us. As we've continued to educate and bring more products and carriers to market, now that's shifted. You know, the, the 1035 exchange into the low cost product, that's, you know, several products or, or solutions down the line. Right now, what we see RA is really using are products that generate income and specifically fixed products. So fixed index annuities are the most popular, you know, product category on our platform uh, that RAs use. And it's typically, you know, making an allocation out of fixed at a fixed income for some period of accumulation because the interest rates in those products are really attractive uh, and then turning it into an income stream. And the reason, you know, RAs are doing that one, as you know, very well, the interest rate environment's horrible. Um, it's hard to find safe investments that you know, can cover your fees, can keep up with inflation, you know, all of that kind of thing. So the annuity can provide you know, a pretty attractive accumulation rate and then a really attractive payout rate. So for example, you know, a typical fixed index annuity that we might have on the platform, you can accumulate in a fixed account at 2.75% today. You know, you can accumulate, you know, for, you know, however many years at a rate like that, and then turn it into a five, six, 7% guaranteed lifetime income payout. And the advantage of those products in which has been eye-opening for a lot of RIAs who haven't been as familiar with annuities is you're not annuitizing to create that income. And annuitizing means, as we talked about earlier, turning your money over to the carrier. It's that irrevocable decision to hear, give the carrier your money and turn it into an income stream. You know, very few people actually do that. It's almost too big of a commitment. Um, the way income typically gets generated is through a rider. And the advantage of that to the to the account holder, the client, and the advisor is the account balance is always available until it's been depleted. So if you change your mind, if you need the money, you can take it out. Um, it's still available. You haven't annuitized. So that's the most popular strategy uh, today that we have. You know, variable annuities, people are getting there. <laughs> they're, they're starting to, you know, starting to get there. But the but because fixed income, I think, is such a challenge as an asset manager, you know, it really makes the annuity uh, in that it, the fixed annuity, you know, much more appealing. Yeah, you know, it's it's certainly going to create a lot of stress in the system. You're, the conversations are happening, but you're you're starting to see them with increased frequency uh, from advisors and others when you have the ten-year sub one uh, percent. Yep. Is what do you do? Uh, you know, and so, um, and forget about the rest of the world where sovereigns are trading at zero and negative. Uh, yeah. You know, and I think many advisors are also woefully unprepared for a potential world in the U.S. where that could happen too. I was joking on Barron's uh, about a month ago where they did a bunch of surveys and polls and they were asking where they thought U.S. interest rates would, would move to and they didn't even have negative as an option. Uh, right. And I said, well, you know, it, it may not be probable, but it is certainly possible 
Yes. And um, that actually makes me even more um, uh, more bullish that it actually happens at some point. So, I mean, one of the things that you know we we talk about is you know what is what's the effect of that for the client? And you see, you know, I, I liken it to you know my waistline, which gradually increases. You know, you don't you don't get uh, overweight overnight. What's happened? What you see happening to client portfolios is they become more and more allocated to riskier investments, whether that's you know heavier into equities or you know income generating products that have more risk than traditional you know bonds or treasuries. And you know there's a terrific you know set of uh, charts that we've got from the Callum Institute that that they looked at if you were looking to generate a seven and a half percent return thirty years ago you could do that being 75% invested in cash. Imagine that, 75% invested in cash, 25% in US treasuries to generate 7.5%. Fast forward 15 years, so 15 years ago, you'd have to be 50% in equities and, and 50% in, uh, in fixed income. In 2019, if you could even get to 7.5% return, you would be 96% in equities and 4% in, in fixed income. So the point being, I don't know that anyone's shooting for a 7.5% return right now or, or expecting a 7.5% return, but basically in order to get the same amount of return, there's more risk in the portfolio. And that gets to be a particular problem when somebody gets in or near retirement. Well, to depress you even more, um, it's actually, I think, worse than that because most pension funds still have that assumption ballpark. And if you look at uh, survey after survey and, and uh, when they ask individuals, it's always around 10%, including yeah. last year's Schroeder's, uh, the U.S. had the highest uh, response rate in the world for uh, equities, which was 15%. And, uh, you know, that's just not going to happen. The, 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 I, there's two other problems I, I foresee with, with what people are going to do about the future in the traditional U.S. stock bond. One is, um, you know, as bonds go negative, I don't think that it's a guarantee that bonds will hedge a down. So you, you have no more income, so that's no question. But people will assume and still make the allocation that bonds will always hedge a U.S. stock decline. And um, you can't count on that. I mean, the, the bond stock correlation has varied over the years. And if you actually look at foreign markets during this past 2020, many of the negative yielding sovereigns didn't help in February and March. And so you create this just really challenging problem. And if you believe us, stocks are overvalued too. So you have sort of a dual headache anyway. Um, right. It, it, it could be problematic. Exactly. So, so where do you find safety, you know, for those people, for, you know, who are in retirement, near retirement, who, like you were talking about earlier, now change behaviorally, right? The, you know, once people get to retirement and near retirement, they're a lot more concerned about their income and preservation of what they've accumulated than trying to accumulate. You know, we, we, one of the things we do is, you know, surveys, we survey our members and you know, we got over 200 RIAs responding to a survey earlier this year and said, you know, what do your clients value more in retirement, you know, predictable income or asset growth? And overwhelmingly, more than 80% are saying predictable income. So where do you find predictable income now uh, when you're saying, you know, the investment markets are challenging in every way? Um, you know, you have to look to annuities. I mean, annuities are a product designed, you know, specifically to do that, uh, create that, you know, efficient, predictable lifetime income. So you guys have a great website. You can register for free, play around, a lot of videos from Wade and others, um, a lot of research. You guys have a nice focus on education. What are some other areas, if there's anything that we haven't talked about uh, that is something that you guys focus on or that even on the stuff we have talked about that is particularly interesting that we've kind of glossed over or uh, avoided? Anything come to mind? Not, not product related, but what I'll tell you, like practice related, business related, you know, I think, you know, some of the interesting things are, and, and the real reason that firms join is, you know, for enhancing their business. So 
the annuity market, for as, as maligned as annuities are, the annuity market's a four and a half trillion dollar market. It's bigger than massive. the entire RAA market. It's massive. So whether you know it or not, your clients probably own annuities. Um, and that represents an opportunity for AUM growth uh, and consolidation of, of relationship. So when we look at annuities, because our annuities are you know, so much you know, better price, so much cheaper than what your client probably owns, you know, in most cases, we can roll them over into a new you know, commission-free annuity, saving you know, clients on average $3,500 a year in fees, mm. bringing the assets under management, eliminating a held away, you know, a, a separate advisor relationship, if, if that advisor still is in touch with them. Um, but that's you know, one area of growth. How does that work? So let's say I'm an advisor, I listen to this podcast, say, uh, Meb, David, you guys sound brilliant. I totally have all these clients who probably have these garbage annuities. Yep. What do they do? They ring you guys, you put it in like a software optimizer, or do you have a, a consulting team? How's it work? Yeah, both of those things. So we invest heavily in technology. So we've got uh, an annuity comparison calculator that literally like is an incredibly complex tool that can literally take any annuity ever sold and model it uh, and then you know compare it against you know the annuities that we have. So and then we've got a team of consultants you know who you know will work with the advisor. So oftentimes the client bought the annuity, they may not even know why they bought it, for what purpose, what features or benefits are in it. So we're going to take a look at it. You know, we you know we can pretty much tell the advisor right away. What the, what the product is designed to do. And then we want to check and say, is that still the goal? You know, is, you know, what is the goal for this client? Do they still need guaranteed income? Maybe they've got, you know, plenty of rental properties or who, who knows what uh, to generate income. You know, what are we looking to do for the client? We can punch that into our calculator and find the most efficient product to do that, um, which is kind of a, you know, a, a reverse approach, you know, from most insurance people are trying to sell you as much coverage as you, they can sell you. We're going to try to tell you what's most efficient for the client, meaning what will take the fewest amount of dollars to generate the outcome they, they need. So we do that through, through technology as well as, you know, our consulting team. And, you know, that's accessible, you know, through our site. We've got, uh, you know, we're, we're also working on partnerships with, you know, lots of other, you know, insurance. Uh, platforms, RA platforms, so it would be available. Those tools would be available in many desktop systems, portfolio management systems. Um, but basically, yeah, if you're that advisor and you've got a you know a bunch of clients with annuities, uh, you know you can give us a ring, talk to our consultants, and they can lead you through the process. And many, we had a firm the other day, as a matter of fact, uh, who had questioned you know whether or not you know they've got clients with you know, with annuities. They sent out an email, you know, to their client base asking if they had any annuities they'd like to have reviewed. They got over a 30% response of their client wow. who had annuities uh, to review. So we wound up with, you know, 90 annuities coming in, you know, coming in for us to take a look at. And I feel like the way that people end up with all those annuities is they have an advisor, which they trust, but they also got a buddy or a cousin or an uncle who sells them some crap annuity and they just put it in a total different bucket. Most of them don't even put it in like, here's my financial advisory bucket. This is just a thing that I bought that someone told me to buy and now I have it. Now I don't know what to do with it. Right. I talk to a lot of people like that. Um, yeah. what is the, what's the typical, if you had to say, kind of demo demographic of someone who's uh, buying annuities? Is it someone who's like 40, saving for retirement? Are people doing it for their kids? Is it what? Typical, I mean, typical 50 to 60 year old, sometimes a little older, but you know, 50 to 60 year old is kind of the sweet spot. And that's like, if you were you know, using annuities you know, productively in your practice, that's probably when you're gonna start thinking about, it. you know, earlier, you know, any earlier than 50, you know, that's what we were talking about previously. You want just to strip down low cost for a high income earner who needs to defer taxes, particularly if they live out in California. Uh, they want to defer some income taxes. You might, you might do that. But the sweet spot is you know, starting to approach retirement 
then you're going to have, if you start thinking about annuities, then uh, you're going to have the most product options yet you know, to, to meet your client's needs the best. We did an old podcast with a, a fella named Paul Merriman. And I don't know if you know Paul, but he runs a, a used to run a RIA in Seattle by the same name. And he, he does a fun thing for his grandchildren where uh, when they were born, he would put 10 grand into a, a variable annuity, but because doesn't trust them, not because they're just kids, but because people or people wraps right. it into a trust so that they can't touch it until they're 50, I think. So that 10 grand, theoretically, if it's, again, all in equities becomes a million dollars. And it's sort of this magical aha moment for people, I feel like, to think about, uh, you know, securing a retirement for not that much money. I mean, 10 grand is a lot of money, but relative to a million dollars later, what a cool idea. Uh, do you, I mean, do you hear advisors or people doing that for young people? I mean, is that, is that a thing that's widespread? I don't even know. I wouldn't say widespread, but I've definitely heard that, you know, in, mm. and it is kind of a, like you said, a very cool way of effectively providing retirement. Um, for a, a relatively modest amount of money. I mean, um, without, and without having to go through, you know, trust and, and planning uh, in, in that regard, just buying a packaged product that, you know, again, the, the owner of the account can't touch without significant penalty uh, prior to, you know, 59 and a half. Interesting. Um, you alluded briefly to insurance. Is that uh, a small part of your, your business thus far? And what are you guys focusing on uh, there too? So when I launched the firm, you know, the goal was let's be able to check the box for each product category an advisor is going to address during a financial plan. And that is, you know, life insurance, long-term care, disability, and annuities, uh, you know, guaranteed income in particular. So, we launched with some life insurance and, you know, and annuities. And over the course of the last couple of years, maybe two months ago, we finally brought disability to market. And earlier this summer, we brought a long-term care product to market. But we, we wanted to do that, you know, for many reasons, but primarily because we want advisors to be able to serve those, you know, those client needs within their practice. Right, because it doesn't make sense. If you're doing financial planning and you're effectively writing a prescription for those products to then send your client away to somebody else to get them fulfilled, right? It, that doesn't make sense on all kinds of levels. You, you, know, you, you run business risk of sending your client to an insurance agent who is, by the way, becoming more and more competitive with you every day. Your typical New York life agent now is a CFP. Uh, not just a life insurance salesman. You know, they want to manage the whole relationship. And you make sure that you know, when you do it, handle it in-house, whether you're using somebody like us, that they get the right amount of coverage you know, and that the money is not coming out of your practice. So it, that's what we really wanted to solve. And you know, we're, that introduction of the disability product uh, through principal you know, a couple months ago kind of finally checked all those boxes but we continue to bring more and more products to market because in life insurance, and I mean, the reason RIAs have been historically just term life users is it's by far the cheapest way to, you know, to get that protection and that coverage. And term life wasn't even something we were going to address in this business because the compensation built into term life is just not that much. You, you really don't change the pricing all that much. But permanent life insurance, is actually a terrific product. Again, when you reprice it, structurally, you can invest you know, in a variable uh, universal life, you can invest in funds, accumulate tax-free, you know, tax and take assets out tax-free uh, you know, from the product. That's, again, a great structure while providing life insurance. The problem, again, has been commissions. In a permanent life product, the commission is typically 60 to 80, sometimes more than 100% of the first year premium. So meaning if you're putting in $10,000 into a permanent life policy, 
thousand dollars of that probably goes to the agent who sold it. Two thousand actually goes into the policy to go to you know to to provide the coverage for for the individual. When you eliminate that commission, that becomes an incredibly powerful product because all ten thousand dollars goes to work in the policy rather than being paid out you know to the agent. So that's you know, but permanent life is something that you know we've definitely seen you know a lot more interest in with you know some education and repricing of the products. And on the flip side, I don't know how you can be listening to this and uh, particularly be a young person in this industry that's commission based and think you have any shot at being a future proof job. Uh, I was smiling as you were talking because you clearly must be doing God's work because there's a beautiful Louisiana sunrise going on behind you that was given David if you're watching this on YouTube, which none of you do, by the way, but if you were, you could see this beautiful halo behind David. Um, you guys are currently structured, to my knowledge, just B2B, right? You're, you partner with RIAs. There's no sort of direct-to-consumer offering, correct? We get a little direct-to-consumer um, from effectively referrals from RIAs. So, you know, for those who are planners, you know, and, and aren't investment managers, uh, you know, who, you know, just provide clients with financial plans and, you know, they'll refer them for their insurance needs, you know, consumers to us. Uh, and that's been a you know a really good thing, but yeah, eventually you know the goal is we we'd like to you know be direct to consumer. I got some ideas for you later on that. We'll take that offline. Um, as you look to the horizon, uh, what other ideas are you guys kicking around? I mean, uh, it's it's as you mentioned a multi-trillion dollar industry. Is it simply um, land and expand in, everywhere you can? Is it to build out? Uh, sales team? Is it onboard new partners? What? Yeah, it's all those things, right? In a startup business, you know, where you're, where you're building it out, you, you're growing in all those different areas. But, you know, when I look at, you know, kind of being methodical about, you know, serving the RIA market, you know, it started with products, right? You've got to have products. If you don't have the products, you don't have a marketplace. You, you, don't, you don't have a business, you know, without the products. So we we started, you know, working with carriers, bringing products to market again, getting them repriced, helping carriers understand how to serve a fee-based advisor or a fee-only advisor, because they're used to paying commissions, not allowing fees to be pulled. So we've had lots of ongoing work to do there, but that's, you know, and we're making tremendous progress. Like I said, 20 carriers, you know, 45, 50 products. So we continue to bring more to market. That will always be a focus. The other part is technology, right? So it's one thing if you've got the products and they're kind of you know, held away and you can't really see them, you know, maybe you get an account balance you know, brought into, you know, from a, with a data feed into your portfolio management system, but it's not really part of your workflow. It's not part of your system. That, so where we've been focused is in bringing our tools you know, onto your know, platform. So, you know, a month, month and a half ago, we announced a partnership with, you know, SS&C Advent for their Black Diamond platform, where they're introducing, you know, the Advent insurance marketplace, you know, powered by DPL. So we will actually have, you know, our tools <laughs> and capabilities built into Black Diamond. So insurance and annuities will, you know, be represented within your portfolio, uh, and you will have the tools to do product discovery and comparisons, you know, that you know, the tools that we've created, you know, that's a big evolution. You know, if ultimately you want to serve that, you know, the RIA marketplace, you've got to basically make it work within the practice, not just provide the products, but provide all of the things uh, from the products, the technology, to the licensing, and all the support, you know, that's necessary. So, for the non advisor individuals out there who are listening to this um what's your advice to them i guess the first part would be just find an advisor to partner with but <laughs> is there anything they can do as far as like if look or like all right i'm not going to get an advisor i'm allergic to them whatever um are there any resources or are there any guidelines as far as getting smart about annuities or places to go to, to at least not jump on a massive landmine <laughs> Yeah, we can, well, we can definitely help. So, I mean, go to, you know, DPLFP, DPLFinancialPartners.com, you know, 
Uh, we, like you were saying, our website, you can register for free. We've got tons of content you know, around annuities and thinking about annuities and how you might use them. Our consultants are happy to help you do, you know, product comparisons, help you find the right product, you know, for what you're concerned about or, or looking for. Um, that's basically what we do all day, um, but usually through an advisor, uh, but we're happy to, you know, talk to consumers, you know, directly. And what do they do though? If they want to go buy one, do they just have to go direct to the sort of issuer or something? No, we do it. <laughs> so oh, really? Like, yeah. So we issue, we're the agent. So that's the same way you know, in working, you know, through RIAs, again, because most RIAs aren't insurance licensed, you know, we work with the RIA to decide on the product. And then ultimately we make the recommendation, we're the licensed agent, we issue the policy. Then we add almost very similar to your custodial account, right? The, you, your client actually owns the custody account at Schwab or wherever the advisor is added, you know, through a power of a limited power of attorney to be able to manage the assets. We basically taken that same model to insurance. So we're the agent, we'll open up the account and then we'll add the advisor through a limited power of attorney to be able to manage, you know, the policy. So, you know, very similar. And so, for the consumer, they can come to us directly. You know, we'll we'll write the policy for them. You know, help them find a a good one uh, rather rather than an expensive one. I wonder what percent are kind of garbage. Could you have a ballpark? Uh, it's garbage, maybe a strong word. What what percent? Let me let me reframe the question. What percent do you think are acceptable that you would put your you know relative or children in? The well, it's again. I'll I'll go to the you know commissions, the root of all evil. You know when it comes to annuities, the because you're talking about the complexity of products. You know, commissions also the reason for complexity. I mean, these products effectively should be commodities, right? I mean, mm -hmm. basically, yeah. a, a tax deferred wrapper with the ability to generate income. It should be a, a commodity. You're just looking at price. You know what what does it cost? What am I getting? What are they paying? What are they getting? because the structure is a commodity. Mm -hmm. So the problem for carriers is in order to sell product, they've got to create all kinds of bells and whistles to try to differentiate and try to you know, create a sales story. So a lot of the commission-based products are one, you know, all that expense that we talked about, complexity that we've talked about. So to me, loads of those products are, I, I won't go so far as to say garbage, but <laughs> they're difficult products. You know, it's hard to get the benefit out of them because of the expense and the complexity and all the features. So looking at, and always a commission-based, a commission-free product is going to be a better product than the commission one. So if you've right. got, you know, the same product from the same carrier, one's commission-based, one's commission-free, the commission-free product is always better. So, I mean, I think that's a pretty simple, you know, pretty simple gauge if you're interested in an annuity. You should always ask your advisor, you know, can I have a commission free product? They can get a commission, you know, wirehouse advisors, broker dealer advisors can all find commission free product. And I think that's a, a general good guide. I mean, just like mutual funds, you want to load mutual fund or you want to no load mutual fund. It's a no brainer. You slap a 7% fee on everything Vanguard offers. And I think Bogle probably would agree it is a steaming pile of poo too. So <laughs> that's exactly um, right. Amazing how that works with commissions. Um, David, this has been great. It's super informative. I, I've actually learned a ton today. Um, as you look back on your career, we always ask people, what's been your most memorable investment? It could be good. It could be bad. Uh, but anything that's seared into your brain, I have about 10 that I could tell you from my E-Trade headquarters and, and L, uh, sorry, San Fran Market Street. But uh, anything come to mind? Oh, well, I can... I can give you the one I missed. I mean, and I can give you a few of those. Um, but number one was AOL. So I, I grew up in Northern Virginia. One of my you know, best and oldest buddies, father founded AOL. Uh, he gave wow. me a call. He gave me a call when I'd been in the work world for, I don't know, a year and said, Hey, my dad's company is going public. You know, and they've got this, friends and family offering. If you want to you know, get in on this IPO, um, you know, it's going out at $10 a share. There's a huge amount of institutional investors getting in. 
they think it's going to pop to like $20 a share within a couple of weeks, you know, it could be a really great opportunity. I had about 1500 bucks to my name, you know, at the, at the time. And I was thinking, what, what's the big deal if I put 1500 bucks in, but it would have been a very big deal. <laughs> and I put 1500 bucks into AOL at its, at its IPO. But back in the, back in the internet days, all the internet companies were all talking to one another, um, you know, trying to figure out how we could work together. At least let me throw some ads up on your site and I'll give you some of my PE money and you can put some ads on my site and you give me some of your PE money. So it looks like at least we're making revenue. Um, but I can remember, you know, talking to eBay and being at, you know, eBay's headquarters and thinking what a dumb idea this is. Right. <laughs> and, and like how wrong you were about that. But at the time, You've got pictures loading up over dial up on, you know, some, you know, taken on some crappy camera of some, you know, piece of junk somebody's selling. And then somebody is supposed to bid on this and send a check cross country. Uh, and then they're on the promise that this person's going to send this item to them. I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. ever going to do this. How wrong That's I was. Fun. It's funny you mentioned those two because there's the very modern equivalent, which everyone can uh, relate to as well, which are the two big ones. I mean, Uber and Airbnb. I mean, I think Airbnb, by the time this, this publishes, will have gone public. But same thing, Uber, no way I'm getting in some stranger's car. And Airbnb, no way I'm staying in some stranger's house or let someone stay in my house. And, you know, I think the, the framework that I heard uh, from an angel, and I can't remember who this was, so I apologize, but uh, said basically the best way to think about startup and angel investing is not all the reasons why it won't work, but if it did work, what if it did work, what could this be? And you can kind of see, obviously from your examples, uh, as well as the more recent ones, the result is hundred billion dollar plus companies. Um, sure. so right. what if DPL does disrupt the entire, uh, annuity space? Um, Awesome. This has been great. Where do people go if they want to find out more about you guys, what you're up to, uh, on board, all that good stuff. DPLFP.com. So David, Peter, Lau, financial partners, DPLFP.com. Uh, that's the best place to find us. And I forgot to ask last question while we're on the topic of startup books. How, how are you guys doing this? You bootstrapping, self-funding? Do you partner with some uh, VC money? How's uh, How are you building it? Yeah, I was. I I bootstrapped it for a while, uh, and then you know then raised some you know private investment uh, through <laughs> through a company called Eldridge Industries, owned by Todd Boley, who's a big investor in the Los Angeles Dodgers. Uh, you know, one of the owners there. And we're currently actually very close to, you know, closing a series B um, to, you know, further expand what we're doing. So it's been, Congratulations. thanks. It's been, it's been really good. We've got almost 50 employees now. This next round of capital will uh, take us through hiring, you know, the next 20, 30 people, uh, which will be terrific. But you know, one of the things when you do this kind of thing, raising money, you're talking about angel investors and that optimism. It's interesting as, you know, as a, an entrepreneur, what you go through, you get the angels and the VCs who are generally optimists. You know, they're the ones who are seeing the vision, they're exciting. They're, and then you get to the stage of taking PE money. And now those guys are the ones seeing all the risk. What are all the downsides? How do I protect myself? Blah, blah, blah. So one of my old jokes is if you're at a cocktail party, you got VC people and PE people, you want to talk to the VC people, much more interesting, much more <laughs> optimistic, happier people in general. Yeah. The, the PE tends to focus all on cash. Um, and, and speaking of, you know, that's something we, when I was thinking about the risks earlier that, that the PE uh, asset class has been the one that many institutions are hoping to be the savior, you know, yep. where, um, equities, bonds, not so much, but PE. Um, Dave, this has been a blast. I've had so much fun. Uh, thanks for joining us today. All right. Appreciate it, Meb. Thanks for having me on. Enjoyed it.